<laughs> and I'd like to thank everyone at City UK uh, for the invitation. And it's a pleasure, uh, as always, to be with you here today, and especially in Manchester, because there's nowhere better than the Northwest to have this discussion about the future of financial and professional services and the industries that you've built, its growth, its critical role in facilitating uh, a forward-moving and growing Britain, which we all need. And we're not far from my own Northwest constituency of uh, Wallasey, which is over on the Wirral, uh, the, uh, and, and, it's, and it's good to be here. Um, the contribution of financial and professional services industry in the Northwest is significant, and it continues to grow year on year. Uh, nationally, one in 13 work in the sector, uh, and it's our country's largest taxpayer. So naturally, as an ex-exchequer secretary, uh, where I used to be uh, responsible for taxing all vices, um, it's good to see some people that pay their taxes um, just in the course of doing their ordinary business. And I don't have to come in as Exchequer Secretary and look for any vices to tax. Uh, we're also the largest exporter uh, of services in the world. And after London, the Northwest is home to the largest number of people who are employed in the industry. In 2021, 8% of those employed in the Northwest worked in the sector, uh, with more than 45,000 people in the Liverpool city region, where my constituency is, also working in the sector. And this is growing significantly. Uh, in the decade to 2021, the Northwest saw 4% annual growth. Uh, so, obviously, uh, in those circumstances, it would be foolish not to be in listening mode, not to be uh, welcoming, uh, interchange and exchange of ideas, uh, to see how we can work together in partnership uh, to help uh, the sector uh, grow, deepen, improve, uh, and export even more um, of the expertise that we have in this country globally. However, alongside this story of growth and the contribution seen in the financial and professional services industry, there's the stark reality of other aspects of the UK economy. I was in the House of Commons chamber yesterday to listen to the Chancellor give his autumn statement, which was actually a, a yet another budget. Uh, and it frankly ignores a lot of the realities of the British economy that everyone uh, in this room knows so well. Growth was significantly downgraded by the Office for Budget Responsibility in the next three years. And they also confirmed that as a country, we face the largest fall in real living standards since the 1950s. Despite the Chancellor's claims uh, about this being a tax-cutting fiscal event, the 2019 Parliament is the biggest tax-raising Parliament since records began with the tax burden now at its highest in 70 years. And those facts, whatever it might say on the front page of the Times today and various other newspapers, were not changed by yesterday's fiscal event. In fact, I think if you look at the FT, they got it um, far more accurately reported than some of the others. So the Chancellor might have cut national insurance contributions, but his continued freezing of tax allowances is due to bring in an eye-watering 52 billion pounds and drag four million people into higher tax bans during the period uh, where it's meant to remain frozen for the, less, for the next five years. So meanwhile, our public services are crumbling, even though we've got a very high tax take, uh, with sewage in the rivers, rack in the schools, and yet the Chancellor penciled in another £27 billion of cuts to public services to pay for his election tax cuts. I wonder whether this is the right priority and it's something that we'll be discussing. And in fact, I made comment on when I responded in the debate uh, on this autumn statement last night in the House of Commons. But after five prime ministers and seven Tory chancellors, four of them in the last 18 months. I think we need a proper change of direction that only a Labour government will bring. I think we need a strategic plan 
for growth, which is going to be set out, a pathway that everybody can see, which is then going to be stuck to, so that everybody knows the general direction and they can work in all of their own individual areas um, and the plans that they have to make, knowing the context that they will be in. I think we need a modernization of our infrastructure. My train was late coming up. Bim's train was late, I hear. Um, probably his fault that mine was late. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, we need to have a situation where we can actually rely on in our infrastructure instead of spending our whole time lamenting how bad it is and how difficult it is to make things work or get anything to run on time. We also need that to get us to net zero and decarbonize our country and create the well-paid jobs of the future. So we need a significant push in that area on sustainability, but we also need a push for productivity increases, including in business investment, and I have to say there was some good news in the autumn statement on, uh, on expensing, but we also need um, uh, more work on, on skills and education so that you invest in infrastructure but you also invest in people and whilst there have been many press releases about that um, in the last few years precious little has actually happened on the ground so little over a year ago uh, there was another iteration of this conservative government which sent the markets into meltdown with their so-called mini budget and now after a period in which we've had all these changes in ministers uh, we've, we've got to a stage where the election is coming up and thoughts and motivations are all about that rather than the, uh, the uh, long-term interests of the country. So I think we need stability, consistency and leadership and I think Rachel Reeves and Keir Starmer are the ones that are going to provide that. We need growth um, and we need to understand quite how much work we need to do to achieve that. Because under successive recent governments, the UK has tumbled down to the bottom third of OECD countries in growth. Uh, and over the coming two years, there are 177 countries which are likely to grow faster than us, according to the IMF. And that will make us the slowest economy in the G7 next year, if the forecasts turn out to be accurate. And so that is why um, we needed, uh, from this autumn statement, to have something that was going to focus on growth. Now, there are 110, apparently, he was boasting about it, the Chancellor, yesterday, 110 initiatives to boost growth. I would say that if you've got 110 initiatives to boost growth, you're not concentrating enough on doing the basic things to set a strategy. You are micromanaging when you should actually be being strategic and aiming in the right direction. So when I hear those kind of numbers, I always think, oh, somebody's got stuck in the detail and they're not thinking about the big issues. I think... Um, I wanted to just say something about how uh, all of you in your sector can best work with a potential Labour government, because whatever your um, views, your personal uh, wishes, it is possible uh, that there'll be a Labour government next year sometime after the general election. I mean, some of us are going to work extremely hard, me, just to make it clear, um, to try to bring that about. And clearly there's been a lot and there's increasing engagement between your sector and our front bench, our party, uh, our regional um, uh, elected representatives, be their mayors or local authority leaders, as well as our front bench down in London. And, and that is clearly, it's important that that carries on. And at the heart of one of uh, the things we want to see is actually much deeper and meaningful devolution than we've got now. Um, Emma mentioned that I was um, in the uh, Department of Environment, Transport and the Regions. That was my first job in the 1997 uh, Labour government. And in fact, I actually did the, um, 
the bill that created regional development agencies. And I think it was a real shame that those were actually abandoned by the coalition government that came to power in 2010 because it put us so far back. We had to start back at the beginning with no structures to do anything. And if we'd have worked with the structures that were there, I believe we would have been um, far further along on the devolution journey um, than uh, we are now. Uh, unlike the Home Secretary, I think it's important to recognise the potential in every area in our country, including Stockton, um, in the North East and of course the North West, for us uh, to enable uh, devolution to begin to create the regional development banks, uh, the local hubs of activity that know their region, that know their area, that don't have to rely on the diktat from uh, Whitehall, which is often unthinking and really unknowing about how you can generate growth regionally. For this reason, Labour enthusiastically supported Financial Services and Markets Bill. It was a bill that I served on, um, particularly the new secondary objective on competitiveness and growth. The formation of the future regulatory framework has been facilitated by the vital contributions that you have made uh, from your positions in the sector. And if we're to achieve the growth that our economy needs to fuel a brighter Britain, uh, which we all want, it will be with the support of your industry, your sectors, uh, with uh, the expertise that you can bring uh, to this area. So we have an ambitious vision in the Labour Party for the reform of capital markets, harnessing insurers and pension fund investment alongside the British Business Bank to re-risk investments, aid liquidity providers investment in high growth firms. Around two trillion worth of assets are held in defined benefit pension schemes. I remember that figure from when I was the pensions minister. And there are further 500 billion in DC schemes. Those will only grow over uh, the period. And as Nest becomes more mature as well, that will uh, also be an important source of potential investment. So if we can support the mobilization of even a small portion of these funds, it would represent a massive source of growth capital, significant extra investment at a time where it's desperately needed. Now, the pensions fund minister in me would say that this obviously needs to be done carefully and with prudence. Um, increased risk in investment has to be taken account of, especially when it's from a pension fund. But doing nothing about it isn't an option. We can certainly use some of that money more effectively than it's being used now without increasing the risk profile that much. So Labour under Rachel Reeves' economic leadership will tattle the bottlenecks that prevent inward investment in Britain's economy, like tattling our broken planning system. And I mean delivering uh, a planning reform, not just talking about it endlessly and backing off when the backbenchers get a bit worried. We're serious about the twin challenges and opportunities, the urgent need to address climate change presents. The awful news uh, the other day that all, all the signatures of the Paris Climate Accord are off track to reach their net zero goals was quite shocking. And the realization that we need a 29% fall in emissions by 2030 to stay on track for achieving 1.5% of global warming uh, is a warning that uh, none of us uh, should ignore, especially as we've just seen a month across the globe that increase, that, where the increased temperatures were 3% uh, everywhere. And at that kind of temperature rise, it becomes impossible for human beings to live and exist on the earth. So we are at the very edge of what we can deal with, and the time to tackle it is rapidly, rapidly disappearing. So we are going to be in a time, if we're going to achieve what we need to achieve, of very rapid transformation. And for that, we need uh, all of your skills to be brought uh, to the party. And it's clear that uh, Labour has a green prosperity plan that will harness, I think, this moment for the good of the country, its environment, but also for our economy. Last month, the Treasury Select Committee, uh, on which I sit, went to Washington and New York. And at each visit, we discussed the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act 
um, on this kind of transformation. It came up across the board uh, with the Council of Economic Advisers at the US Treasury, at the New York Stock Exchange, amongst others. This act and the European response to it signals that the clean energy race is well and truly underway. And if we don't join it, we will be left behind. There was very little, I'm afraid, about that in the autumn statement yesterday. And as I mentioned, you uh, can all no doubt um, recite Labour's five missions with your eyes closed. We have to do it um, every morning uh, <laughs> before we go to work. But um, for that first mission, which is growth, puts front and centre the work of the financial and professional services sector as we tackle cl the climate change crisis. If we're to achieve these missions, it's your industry and your sector that will enable us. As Tulip Sadiq announced in the City UK earlier this summer, she, I think she uh, spoke to you, Labour will unlock billions of financial services investments to cut bills, create jobs in clean energy, and deliver energy security. Through delivering reform of solvency two, we'll support clean energy through capital from the insurance sector, and we'll empower financial services to invest alongside a Labour government and its green prosperity plan in the jobs and industries which will power our future. All the while, we'll ensure that we crowd in and unlock private investment as the Inflation Reduction Act has achieved through public investment. We'll ensure that there's a clear path ahead for the UK green taxonomy and sustainable disclosure requirements, providing the city with the certainty going forward that will enable it to invest and in securing our reputation as a green finance world leader. So we'll explore the use of green covered bonds with experts to assess the role that they could play in releasing billions in investment from the city in green infrastructure. If this could be done, it would allow your industry to lend and borrow at far less cost for net zero infrastructure. Offering a significant boost to green project investment, which is what we need to kickstart the transformation which is becoming uh, more and more urgent. Significantly to us here in Manchester today, Labour will prioritise tackling regional inequality to ensure that investment in your sector is seen nationwide and not concentrated in London. Now, I'm not accusing you of being concentrated in London. You clearly are not. But we don't want to see a concentration of developments uh, and, and growth in London only. Outside of London and the South East, $700 million in fintech investment is seen each year a figure not to be scoffed at, but this pales in comparison to the nine billion invested in London annually. So Labour has a plan to create tech hubs in every region of the country, facilitated by Skills England, to found fintech hubs in every part of Britain. Working alongside education, we would skill up the people of Britain to harness the technological developments we're living through and benefit people in all of our regions. It's clear as we look at the challenges the Labour government will have to tackle, not least the financial challenges, if one takes a close look at the books uh, and the OBR report and the Green book from yesterday. Uh, we will have a significant challenge uh, to tackle and we'll have huge opportunities that will have to be seized. Now, that can only be done in partnership with strategies, with clear signaling of direction, not chopping and changing, not constant inward battles, but a proper uh, way forwards. So we're looking for a new covenant forged between the financial and professional services industry and the government, working together to create a brighter future for our country, facilitated by a flourishing financial sector that works for everyone, because through partnership, we all win. Thank you very much.